So let, let's get started here. Um, I just was asked to ask you to please be more friendly with your neighbor. Not in a bad way. Not in a bad way. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, welcome to the inaugural lecture in uh, the Marcellus Shale Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Marcus Bursick, the chairman of the Department of Geology here at UB, and I'll be introducing the speaker in a minute. Um, I did want to say a few things before we get started. Um, uh, first of all, we have a lot of people here from different, uh, different perspectives and everything. We got people from the energy industry here, from environmental industry, uh, investors, uh, government, and po political people, uh, interested citizens, and especially students. And um, so wide diversity of people here, and it's really great to see everybody here, and, and thank you very much for, for coming and, and showing some interest in this topic that's very important for our, our state right now. I wanted to thank, uh, thank a few people before we get started. One is the Office of Special Events uh, that's head, but headed by Bill Regan here. Uh, they've helped to organize this uh, lecture series and, and done all the logistics, and it's been really, really wonderful. Uh, Mike Joy, uh, a local uh, barrister, has helped me organize the, the, the talks, and uh, John Holka also. Uh, and then I wanted to thank uh, all of our speakers that we'll, we'll have. And, Today, I'd like to thank you, Rayola, for, for coming and, and joining us. Um, let me out, outline a little bit about the reasons for the talk series and, uh, and then the format that we'll, we'll use for them. Um, the, the main reason why I was interested in, in organizing this talk series was uh, to help our students in our geology department. Energy resources is a very important of a geological education. And, and we've not been able to cover it very well in our department over the past few years. And I was hoping that this talk series could act as a, a catalyst for, for helping us to, to be able to cover this very important uh, part of a geological education. So I'm really happy that our, some of our students made it here today. And, and uh, thank you for coming. We're going to be recording all of the talks. And they'll be available on the web uh, as podcasts uh, and um, and uh, along with the, the slide presentations. So uh, we haven't quite worked out where that's going to be put on the web right yet, but um, everything should be up on the web at least by the end of the, the talk series. So that's going to provide us with a resource in the department for, um, for, for our students in the future. Um, another goal that, that we had in, in uh, starting this talk series was to act as a foundation for um, a network or an institute even uh, on uh, black shale energy resources, both here in New York State and around the world. These are, th these are energy resources that are uh, spread throughout the entire world. And it's uh, really important for our students to know about that, not just because oh, you know, we might be doing more with them in New York State, but because for us, um, you know, our students will be looking at these deposits all over the world. Uh, in New York State, it's, it's gotten to be a very complicated topic, as I'm sure everybody here knows. And you know, it's got a very high-powered mix of uh, geological and environmental, regulatory, and, uh, and political aspects to it. Uh, so we want to try to, to help that uh, discussion along and act as an, an objective uh, place where people can exchange ideas. So hopefully, this talk series will, will help us inaugurate this network or institute uh, centered around uh, our black shell resources. Um, I also wanted to make sure to invite the, the, the public uh, as part of this talk series. I could have just done it as, as part of a class, something like that. That would have been fine. But since it is such an important topic to us in New York State, I wanted to, to actually make sure that this talk series was, was uh, available to the public. And I see that that's kind of paid off here. So it's really great to, to have everybody here. And, and thank you very much, very much for coming. It's wonderful, wonderful to see all this interest. Um, this particular talk series um, that we're inaugurating this with is, is 
centered on the industry of uh, oil and gas exploration and, and oil and gas resources and exploitation, particularly in New York State. So, so this, this talk series that, that we're having this, this spring uh, centers on uh, how the gas is explored for, uh, where it is down there under the ground, how the, how the drilling is done, how the fracking is done, how wells are completed, how they're regulated, how property and, and mineral rights are, are obtained by the uh, resource companies, just that whole aspect of how the, the industry works and, and how the economy of the industry works. It'll get, this, this series will get into the environmental issues a little bit at the very end. Our last speaker is uh, formerly with the NYSERDA and he's gonna talk about the, the regulatory and, and, and the environmental issues a little bit more. So it'll, it'll go into that. I'm hoping that this is just one of a number of talk series that we'll be able to have in the department, and some of the others would, would maybe uh, center on some of these other aspects of, of the whole issue of uh, gas exploration and exploitation in, in New York State. Um, as far as the, the format for the talks, um, I hope everybody either pre-registered or, or registered out there. We wanted to do that uh, partly to just make sure we had a big enough room uh, for all the people that, that might show up. And it looks like we just barely made it this time. Um, kind of maxing out here. Um, so that really helps us to make sure that the venue is big enough each week. So uh, if, if you could keep doing that and uh, make sure that you do register for the, the talks that you're interested in, that will really help us. We might need to boost it up into other rooms. So if that happens, we can uh, find out about that. But we can also let you know if it's going to meet in another room uh, another week. Uh, and the other reason for, for the registration was um, to get, um, get an idea of who's going to be here and find out where, where people are coming from, that kind of thing, and let you know about any other talk series that we're able to organize or other upcoming events that you might be interested in that touch upon this topic of, of gas drilling in, uh, in New York State. Uh, so, so please do register. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, uh, in, a, in a second, uh, uh, Rayola uh, Dewar will give, give her talk. Uh, after, after her talk, I'm going to give just a couple of minutes for people to, uh, to move around a little bit, and particularly for people to leave if, they, if, if people have time constraints. Uh, so I'll give, we'll have two minutes or so for people to get up and, and take off if they need to or, or stretch us if you want. And then we'll, we'll go into a, uh, a, 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 the question and answer session. Um, I'm going to open that up to the students first um, because it's a little bit hard for students to ask questions when there's uh, uh, older folks around. <laughs> so I'm going to open it up to students to ask their questions first and then, and then we'll open it up to the general questions. Um, and then I, I believe that they're going to just turn off the lights and lock all the doors at about 10 p.m. So we do want to try to wrap it up by that time. Um, so that, that'll give us two hours for, for the talk and for the question and answer period. Uh, and then right now I'd like to ask you to, to turn off your uh, cell phones or at least put them on vibrate so that we're not, uh, so that the speaker's not, not bothered by that. The speaker in, uh, this time is uh, Rayola Dewar who works with the, uh, who's the senior economic advisor with the American Petroleum Institute. American Petroleum Institute is a trade association of the oil and gas industry. Um, she's uh, in the media relations department. Um, she's, she is one of the uh, petroleum industry's uh, principal spokespersons. Uh, her efforts uh, focus on informing policymakers, news media, and the, the public on energy and energy market issues and trends. And she's here to tell us in particular this week how gas uh, fits into the uh, energy uh, situation. Uh, and I found out in looking over her CV here that her undergraduate degree is from Brockport. So she is a, a, a local girl and it's really great to, to have you back in Western New York. Uh, Rayola Dewar. Thank you. Got my water just in case. All my backup notes. Oops. Yeah. All I need is a clicker. Okay. All right. That's all right. I'm good. Oh, it's right in the way. Oh. <laughs> See, it's just, it's, oh, this, it, oh, every time I start something, it's like this. I get all discombobulated with the technology. 
But I'm very happy to be here, and I, I really feel honored to have the opportunity to open up this series. I, I, I think it's a great idea, and, uh, and I hope that uh, it's at least interesting and provocative. I'm looking forward to your questions. It's always the favorite part of any presentation I give. And the topic is a good one uh, for me. It's a, uh, a happy one, natural gas and America's energy future. And I think it's, it's looking very bright for the United States for many reasons. But when we think of natural gas, uh, it has so many things going for it. It's a very versatile fuel. Uh, we use it, as you know, to heat our homes and run our businesses, our industrial processes, and to generate electricity. And, and, and in our petrochemical industry, there's hardly anything really in our modern lifestyle that isn't connected one way or the other with natural gas. So it has that versatility going for it. It's also a low carbon emitting fuel compared with the other fossil fuels. And so that's a big plus as we look to our future. And the, the biggest thing really is the technological breakthroughs that have allowed us to bring much more to the market than we ever thought feasible even six, seven, eight years ago. And it really has changed the vision of what our energy future can be. So, and, and in doing so, and being able to bring some, so much more into the marketplace, it means the price is going to be less. It is less now, and we're looking to a future with relatively low-cost natural gas. So for all those reasons, it's a, it's a big win for us. But I should start by saying I am very prejudiced. As Marcus mentioned, I work for the American Petroleum Institute, and that is a trade association for oil and natural gas companies. We have been around since 1919. Congress asked oil companies to get together um, during World War I because we had a very hard time moving the fuel with the troops. And, and that was because there was no standardization in the industry. Pipes didn't fit one another. There was no standard processes. And so there was a real need, a recognized need, to standardize uh, our procedures, recommended practices. So a big part of what we do today is just that. We have about 500 different um, recommended practices, standards. About 100 or so have been adopted as part of the regulation. And it's an, uh, we use experts from around the world to continually review technology. And it's an ongoing process. It's been going on for over 100 years. We have offices in uh, Singapore in Beijing and Dubai and, of course, here in the United States and a lot of certification programs where we do a lot of training. And, and we do it, too. We have recommended practices, for example, for hydraulic fracturing. So with that, also I want to mention, as an industry, we employ about 9 million people. Uh, we account for 60 percent of all the energy that we use in this country. About 25 percent of that is natural gas. And we contribute, really, well, it's about $100 million a day in revenue, to, uh, tax revenue, to the government. So what we do, what we invest in, or what we fail to invest in makes a difference, and a big difference to us and to the quality of our life. And I brought along this slide. I don't know if you can see it in the back, but what it does show is what the world looks like at night. And you can see the parts of the world that are lit up. They're the most developed parts of the world. And I think we take a lot of this for granted that, uh, and don't really pause to consider how energy really does fuel our economic lives. We come home at the end of the day, you know, it's dark in the house, we flip on a switch, and we hardly really think about where that energy comes from or what it takes to be there. There are people around the world today, there are, there are women in Africa that spend five hours a day just collecting firewood. And uh, the world is on the move. And the investments we make make a difference, and they make a difference to the quality of life. Natural gas is going to fuel a lot of that light out there. And, uh, and thinking of light or thinking of trying to provide a context for this discussion tonight, I thought it would be useful to look at how we, how we have fueled our nation over the years. And this chart, we were a biofuel society, of course, and the, the chart starts in, uh, I think, 1859. And it shows how most of the fuel that we used was, was wood. And then by 1900 or so, it, uh, it, went to, um, it went to coal. And there were articles written at the time. Folks were worried about running out of coal. And why wouldn't you be? It was, they were so dependent on it. And much like we, we have articles today worried about some of our resources and running out of them, oil, natural gas. Um, and you can see, let's see. This is oil and how long it took before it became a major player in the marketplace. 
natural gas. The first natural gas shale uh, well was drilled here in New York, about 50 miles from here, back in 1821. But natural gas really didn't take off, and it really hasn't reached its full potential yet, I don't think. And up here is nuclear, I guess. I'm sorry, I have to keep turning back and forth here. Um, and then renewables on the top. So we really, you know, just like if you think of the folks back at the turn of the last century, and what do they really know about the future? And especially what that century was going to, was, was coming at them, they had no clue. They didn't know about the cars or airplanes or men on the moon or the way we can communicate with one another instantaneously. But they did have an idea of what they needed 30, right in front of them, or 10, 20, 30 years down the road. But then I think much like, we are much like them. I mean, we can see what's right in front of us, but we, we don't know the technological breakthroughs that will happen. And all we know is that we consistently underestimate the power of technology to transform our lives. And we, we see it all the time in the oil and natural gas industry, and I think natural gas is a good, uh, uh, a good place to start in terms of how we had one vision just five, five years ago, one vision of our future, investments being made based on that vision, and then having that change almost on a dime with new technology to access uh, shale natural gas. Five, six years ago, we were looking at siting natural, uh, offshore natural gas plants, liquefied natural gas, to import natural gas. Now we're thinking to use those facilities to export it, perhaps to Asia. So it, it's a, a very different world, and it's changed just due to that, that technology. But I wanted to provide a broader base to, to look at energy, and did need to mention, this is a little hard to look at, or maybe more than a little hard. All it does is really show us um, how much our economic growth, the forecast for economic growth, almost all of the slides I have are from the Department of Energy and their most recent estimates. And they're looking at uh, our GDP maybe doubling between now and 2035, population increasing by maybe 28% or 30% by 2035, and yet the amount of energy we're going to use is forecast to decline. Uh, we'll use about 40% less energy for every dollar of GDP than we do today, which is just about on a par with what we've been doing over the last 30 years or so. A lot of this is structural changes, becoming more of a service-oriented uh, society than an industrialized society. And a lot of it is energy efficiency improvements, too. So our biggest source overall of energy moving forward is going to be the energy we don't consume. We're going to save a lot. Without, having, with, without this energy efficiency improvement, our energy needs would double in the next 20 years, or 25 years. So that's, that's a really significant savings. And this is what it looks like. Um, this is, shows us, oh well, since, let's see, 1980. And the middle bar is where we are today in terms of the kinds of fuels that we use. And the far right shows the Department of Energy's very latest estimate for where we'll be in uh, 2035. And the blue on the bottom, the biggest source of energy right now is oil. A second to that is, is, uh, is it the gas? It is gas. And then coal, and then nuclear, and hydro on the top, and renewables. And you can see a gradual growth in some of the other uh, renewable fuels, but still the predominant fuels we're going to need moving forward. Natural gas is going to be a very important source of our energy future. So is coal, so is oil, so with many of the fuels we use today, a lot of that is already baked in in terms of um, uh, the technology we have, the capital investments that have been made with uh, new inventions and new fuels that will change, but it's going to take some time. Oh, this is a table with a bunch of numbers, but mostly it, it just, it's, again, it shows you the, the detail for those among you that are analysts and really like to see the numbers. This is uh, EIA's forecast of how fast different kinds of fuels will, will move in the future. And I think the thing to note about, oops, because there's a lot of optimism about how fast we can get renewable fuels into the fuel mix, or optimism about how fast we can displace uh, coal with renewable, or how fast we can, we can uh, uh, use renewables in our transportation sector. And I think they're going to be growing, and they're going to be very important. But uh, the speed is going to take some time. And, even, and the Department of Energy is looking at a really rapid ramp up in biofuels over 100% or so. For the transportation sector, they're looking at about 300% ramp up. But still, we're going to need a lot more of the oil and natural gas in our future. 
And this, this breaks it out a little bit so you can see where we are today in terms of the oil and the coal and natural gas and renewables and what kind of renewables we have. And I think all together accounts for about 8% of our, of our fuel mix. And then in 2035, it doesn't look a whole lot different. It's about 14%. And you can see natural gas is not forecasted to change that much. I would have thought it would be a bigger percentage, but right now, uh, this is their latest forecast, and it doesn't look a whole lot different uh, in this latest forecast than it does in 2008. And it's also helpful to think how we use our different fuels, and this attempts to do that. The blue shows you where, where our oil goes, and of course we all know goes, a lot of it goes to transportation, but also to the industrial sector, and a little bit less for home heating oil, primarily in the Northeast. And natural gas, you can see, it's big in residential commercial, we kind of know that. Um, what could be surprising to a lot of folks is what, what a small share it is in, in our electricity generation relative to, say, coal, for example. Um, and when we move forward, the view doesn't change a whole lot. Uh, you can see the blue, the light blue are renewable fuels, and you can see them making a, a dent in some of the transportation needs. And, and a dent in industrial, too, and down with electric power, you can also see uh, growth in that, uh, primarily, much more so than the natural gas. I'm just going to, that's just a general header. This gives you a broader look of natural gas use, 2009, um, and we can see where our gas, where the gas goes. About a third or so goes to the electric power and then the industrial sector, residential, commercial. The little orange, the 1%, is for transportation uh, needs. And moving forward, I think the president mentioned the other day, wants to incentivize and see a lot more natural gas in our transportation sector. And right now, I think the price of natural gas is about half the price of oil on a, on a BTU basis, on an energy equivalent basis. And the forecast moving forward is that it would be at least that, so it will have a price advantage. Uh, but when you look, look at some of the, there are some obstacles to how rapidly you can expect it to be, uh, to be viable. For one, it costs anywhere from $17,000 to $60,000 more for these long distance truckers to use natural, a natural gas fueled vehicle. So the vehicle itself is more expensive. The range is less, uh, diesel fuel, Big truck can go about a thousand miles uh, with CNG or, or uh, compressed natural gas or liquefied natural gas. You only have oh about a hundred to four hundred miles, so that's a limitation. But you could see in cities, and we see it a lot in various cities, uh, natural gas fleets are, are really viable if, because the distance isn't so great. But even the infrastructure itself, I was looking recently at EIA's um, analysis of uh, investments in infrastructure. You would need, depending on the size or the volume of sales, you, it would cost anywhere from 15 to $1.50 more per gallon on a BTU basis to break even. So it would be more expensive for the infrastructure, too. So you have all of those costs there. And uh, without some additional uh, uh, technological breakthroughs or at least a relatively really, really inexpensive natural gas. It could take some time before you could see it make significant inroads into the transportation sector. But I think long term, uh, it's, it's certainly very viable. And we may go in a bigger way than is forecast right now toward using more natural gas in our vehicles. And uh, oh, um, this is a Department of Energy slide, and it talks about changes in the demand for natural gas. and. Uh, primarily driven by movements in the electric power sector. But if you look to the left in the top bar, it shows the industrial sector set and, and what a steep decline that has been. And that decline is almost correlated directly with the price of natural gas, which was quite high. And what's happened to a lot of manufacturing jobs and other jobs that have left the United States in part because the energy cost was too high. So now, with less expensive natural gas, I think we can expect to see a lot more industry come home, and uh, a lot of industry locate in areas that do have natural gas. So it's, it's going to be a, a big plus in that regard. And in terms of the growth of electricity, again, these are uh, Department of Energy forecasts, and they're seeing the growth is, is really tra trailing off. Uh, the increase will be very modest moving forward. 
and structural changes, energy efficiency, all of those will play out in, in the pace of demand, which is one of the reasons you don't see as much natural gas as, as you might guess in the future. And renewables gain a big part of the electric market share, and they may be even bigger than this. This, this, this forecast is modeled on what's in place now with different uh, assumptions about the pace of that development. You could have even more renewables. But the renewables are, are displacing a little bit of the coal, but coal is still going to be a very significant part of our electric generation for many years to come. Gas is still important in the blue, and you can see the big ramp up in the renewables, and that will make a, a big dent in the electric market. And this gives you a little bit more detail about that. It shows electric, uh, gen how much natural gas or renewables account for electric generation today. Natural gas is in blue and the coal and, the, and that dark color. And the little, the little bar on the right is the increase moving forward. Again, much of the increase in our electricity will be fueled by both of those fuels, natural gas and, uh, and renewables. And this does, shows us where, where we've been, our history in terms of our consumption and our production of natural gas. And the difference between the two, of course, have been imports. And until very recently, that, that picture was quite different moving forward. We had an energy scenario that everyone agreed on, uh, showed a much sharper need for natural gas imports. That picture has changed now uh, to virtually none moving into the future. And it's all because of technolo technologies and technological improvements and being, being able to access the shale gas. And this just gives you a dramatic uh, look at the annual energy forecast, the annual AEO, annual, annual energy outlook in 2005, what, they, what EIA thought our imports would be, and then what their most recent forecast shows. And it's just really a dramatic change in what we're going to need. And that really all comes down to our sources of natural gas. On the left is the history, and on the right uh, are the forecasts. And you can see the shale in purple, how important that's going to be from now uh, till 2035 and beyond. And ultimately, right at 2035, it makes up almost half of the natural gas we're, go we're going to use. And imagine if we didn't have it, uh, what the slope of that curve would look like in terms of the imports would be very, very dramatic. But the picture has changed. It's changed almost, almost overnight. So the, the potential is, is, really, is really something. And it's come on quick. It's come on hard. Uh, and you can see it on the right, on the far right, in 2011. And the shale portion, the unproven shale gas, is the, the dark part on the top of those bars in the past several years. And that's where our resources are growing, and that's where the estimates are growing. And there's a, there's a variety of them. I mean, it's not just the Department of Energy, others too. And here's, here's a handful of them in terms of the United States. And they're all, all very significant. For the world, and of course, there's shale all over the world. Uh, we have uh, a lot of shale regions and a lot of different estimates. One of the most recent uh, calls for 6,350 trillion cubic feet of shale gas in the world. That's equivalent to about a 60-year supply or so at today's, uh, at today's consumption pace. So it's big, it's significant. We are in the forefront of that exploration and development, but others are moving up fast. Poland, uh, China, India, they're all looking to shale gas and looking to a possibly a, a different energy future than they thought that they could have too. And shale gas is all over the United States. It started pretty big uh, operations. I mean, we always knew we had this gas. We just couldn't access it economically. It uh, started in the Barnett about a dozen years or so. And of course, it's, it's going big in the Marsalis operation in, in Pennsylvania these days. So I'm going to pause here and ask the tech guys to, to play. I brought a little video with me, because I, I just thought it would be better explaining just a, a simple explanation of what is involved in, in drilling and fracturing a well. And it's just a kind of a 101 view. You're going to have in this lecture series folks that can really bring you through the process in a very a detailed way. But this is just to give an, an opening overview. Thank you.
Let's take a look at the horizontal drilling and stimulation processes that have made shale exploration so successful. A drill bit is mounted on the end of the drill pipe. As the bit grinds away, a mixture of water and additives, called mud, is pumped into the hole to cool the bit and flush the cuttings to the surface. The mud also cakes on the walls of the well bore, keeping it intact. Similar to a vertical well, the hole is drilled to just under the deepest fresh water near the surface. The drill pipe and bit are then removed. Surface casing is inserted into the drilled hole to isolate the fresh water zone and also serves as a foundation for the blowout preventer, a safety device that connects the rig to the well bore. Then, cement is pumped down the casing and out through the opening of the shoe at the bottom of the casing. It is then forced up between the casing and the hole, sealing off the well bore from the fresh water. The cementing process prevents contamination of the freshwater aquifers. The pipe and bit are lowered back down the hole to drill through the plug and cement and continue the vertical section of the well to approximately 500 feet above the planned horizontal leg. This depth is called the kickoff point, where the curve will begin so the horizontal section can be drilled. Up to this point, the process is the same as drilling a vertical well. Again, the pipe and bit are pulled out of the hole and a downhole drilling motor with measurement while drilling instruments is lowered back into the hole to begin the angle building process. The distance to make the curve from the kickoff point to where the well bore becomes horizontal is just under a quarter of a mile. Once the curve is completed, drilling begins on the well's horizontal section, called the lateral. The pipe used to drill the well measures 30 feet in length and weighs approximately 495 pounds each. It takes over 350 pieces of pipe weighing nearly 87 tons to drill a 10,500 foot well. At various stages of drilling, the pipe is taken out of the hole for tool and bit changes and put back in. This process is called tripping pipe. When the targeted distance is reached, the drill pipe and bit are removed from the well bore one last time. Production casing is now inserted into the full length of the well bore. Cement is again pumped down the casing and out through the hole in the casing shoe, forcing the cement up between the casing and the wall of the hole, filling the open space known as the annulus. Casing the well is a very important process because it permanently secures the well bore and it prevents hydrocarbons and other fluids from seeping out into the formation as they are brought to the surface. At this point, the drilling rig is no longer needed. A temporary wellhead is installed and the location is prepared for the service crew who will perf, frack and prepare the well for production. The first of these steps is to perf or perforate the casing. A perforating gun is lowered by wire line into the casing to the targeted section of the horizontal leg. An electrical current is sent down the wire line to the perf gun and sets off a charge that shoots small holes through the casing and cement and out a short distance into the shale formation. The perf gun is then pulled out of the hole. Next, because the shale is tight or compressed, the well will have to be fracked. Known as hydraulic fracturing, this is a process where water, sand, and additives are pumped into the well bore and down the casing under extremely high pressure. As the mixture is forced out through the perforations and into the surrounding rock, the pressure causes the shale to fracture. This creates a fairway connecting the reservoir to the well and allows the released gas to flow to the well bore. Next, a temporary plug is placed at the heel or left side of the first stage frack. The plug closes off or isolates the perforated and frack section of the well bore so that the second stage section of the horizontal leg can be perforated and fracked. Tight reservoirs do not contain natural fractures and therefore cannot be produced economically without hydraulic fracturing. 
The permeability is increased by providing pathways through which gas can flow more easily. With advancements in technology, multi-stage fracking has become the standard for tight gas reservoirs. This process of perfing and fracking can be repeated several times to cover the entire horizontal distance of the wellbore. Once fracking is completed, the plugs are drilled out, allowing the gas to flow up the wellbore. The next step is to install a permanent wellhead, also known as a Christmas tree, and other necessary surface equipment. A pipeline is then built to transport the gas to the pipeline network. As field development expands, additional pipeline infrastructure is built. Thanks to the vision and persistence of those who have perfected these new technologies, shale plays across the U.S. have become an innovative and highly productive source of new energy for our country. Said it better than I could. I don't know about that music, though. Um, can we go back to the slides, thanks? So this is a technology that we've been, not the horizontal part, but uh, we've been fracking wells for, I think, about 60 years now, uh, uh, over a million wells in the United States. And it's, it's becoming increasingly important to us. Uh, about 55% of all the wells drilled right now use this process. And without it, we'd lose about 45% of our natural gas production and about 17% of our oil production within five years if we were using this combination of horizontal and, and fracking. So, uh, and it first started in the Barnett in Texas. And uh, the map on the left just shows you the number of drilling operations that were going on at the time in 1997. And most of them, they're, they're little tiny black dots. These were vertical uh, wells. And if you look to the right, that's, uh, what year is that? That's 2009, and between that time they have about 12,000 new wells, most of them done horizontally. And this gives you another view from the Department of Energy data that just shows over the last several years, and you can look, gee, you know, back 2002, 2004, just a few years ago, most of them were vertical wells, and then you can see the blue and how rapidly that's ramped up. And it's also meant for Texas, this is a similar chart, it just shows uh, the number of jobs they've gotten and uh, the economic uh, uh, increase in the value added for, for Texas. So it's, it's been big, not just for Texas, I, I think for, for the nation as well. Um, there are about six, seven, eight different big plays going on. The Barnett is shown in the brown on the bottom and that little bright pink toward the top is the Marcella Shale where we are now and it is providing most of the growth that we're seeing going on in the United States. And here's another way to look at it. Just, just six shale gas plays alone have uh, accounted for all of the increase that we've seen in natural gas, all of it, over the last several years. So it, it has been, uh, it's been big and it's made a big difference to our country. And the Marsalis, I'll get into this just a little bit. Uh, it's about 40 to 50,000 square miles, and as you know, a lot of it overlaps into New York. It's heavily into Pennsylvania and West Virginia, a little bit in Ohio as well. And the, they've been going like gangbusters in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I just brought along a slide to show the difference in the, in the number of wells drilled just between 2008 and 2009 on the left, and then again on the right. They had 604 new wells in 2008, and they had twice that in 2009. I don't know what 2010 looks like, but I'm, I'm sure it's up there. And you can see the, the border with New York, and you can see where the wells sort of stop and where New York is, and as probably most of you in the audience know, uh, you've been under uh, a review since the year 2008, about three years now, doing a supplemental generic environmental impact statement. And uh, it's due to be complete, I think, by the latest I heard, by the end of this summer. Uh, and this is to set the stage for how you're going to regulate this, how we're going to manage the process, how you manage the water, how you manage uh, all of it start to finish. 
And New York has taken a lot of time and I think probably an awful lot of effort under those that are undertaking this, this mammoth job to make sure they have it right. So we're hoping we'll be able to begin permitting processes maybe in the fall, but we'll see. And the other study, primarily I relied on the slides you're looking at before really from the Department of Energy and I brought along some more slides from a study that we commissioned from Tim Cassadine and it was about the economic impact of Marsala shale to, to the region. The, and I brought along a few different uh, slides to just try to illustrate, although they all look alike. Uh, this, this first one talks about the estimated natural gas production from Marsala's development. And it, it can be over nine trillion, uh, I mean, nine trillion or nine million cubic feet a day uh, by 2020. The yellow is West Virginia, the, the reddish color is uh, Pennsylvania, and then the blue on the bottom is New York. So within about 10 years, and that number is kind of meaningless to most people, but it represents about 15% of total U.S. natural gas consumption right now. And that's the midpoint estimate. Actually, in his estimates, he has a high estimate, too, which would double that amount, or about 30% of total U.S. natural gas consumption. So that's a significant amount, although just a small amount is, is assumed to come from New York, partly from, from the late start, uh, but also uh, just the geology itself and how rapidly you might be able to get up to speed on this. The next one is, is the value added. Again, they, they kind of all look alike, but uh, it's, it's in the billions of dollars. And again, that's the kind of the, the mid case. It can be as much as $25 billion by the year, uh, in 10 years from now. Taxes generated, same thing in the, in the billions of dollars. This is two, but it could be up to three or more billion dollars. And it would be millions of dollars in, in New York State. Local, state and local taxes, pretty much the same. The one was federal, the, the state looks pretty similar. You can you could be up to billions of dollars. And then jobs, of course, hundreds of thousands, really. Most of them in, in Pennsylvania, but a lot, a growing amount in West Virginia, too. And some, some forecasts for New York. I brought along the table. This is from the study, and it just shows the economic impact. This is assuming the, we're going to start development in 2011, and that might be an optimistic assumption at this point. But it shows employment, thousands, tens of thousands of jobs, the value added in billions and uh, the state and local tax revenue. And of course, all the energy that it would bring to this, to, this, uh, to this state. And this is my only lame joke. Economists love you know, to talk about economies of scale. So for me, the bottom line is really some of the economies of the, of the shale operations and what it really means when I look at these numbers and I look at what we could have. And again, I'm relying on, on the Department of Energy this just shows the average price, the history of the average price of, the, uh, uh, of natural gas, the spot price. And then what they think moving forward, and it shows their different estimates depending on which year they were making the estimate. And just in the last few years alone, the most recent estimate is the line on the bottom. And the, the point here is they're expecting natural gas prices to really stay low for a significant period of time. And I don't think that's an unrealistic expectation given the resource base given the pace of development, given our need for energy, and especially for clean burning fuel. So that to me says a lot, that we're going to have low natural gases, gas prices and could really uh, look to a future like this, not only with plentiful supplies, but uh, that they're affordable. And finally, this is a complicated slide, but it does reinforce the point, and, and to me, the only part of the slide that's really, well, there's a couple interesting parts, but. The left, when you look at the graph, is, is what our imports would look like in the red line if we had no shale development. Their reference case is, is a little old right now, and then their high U.S. shale scenarios really using an assumption of, of a lot less natural gas than, than their estimates show today. So I think that line would be even steeper and sharper if they were to update it. And for me, the very important point is the price in the chart. And if you look right here, with no shale, they have it at over $10. Reference right now, where we're at maybe $9 per, per million of BTU. And the high at $7.62. It could be less, but it says that difference between the over $10 and the $7 value, or 27% difference, 
is a difference in the quality of our lives. And I think it can make a difference in the homes of many people in this country, and, and not just in this country, uh, around the world. And I think it's gonna make a big difference in what we're gonna be able to achieve, uh, how we're going to be able to look to a, a lower carbon future than we might otherwise have had if we didn't have this natural gas. And the energy and the value and the affordability is going to change the lives of a lot of people, not just here in the United States, but I, I think around the world. So to me, it's very exciting and to see something that dramatic happen in just a handful of years and to see a different future than we might have had is, is very exciting. And uh, it has a lot of interesting aspects to it and a lot to sort out, but I was asked to give a kind of an overview and an introductory to place natural gas, where, where it is in our lives, and where it might be in the future. So that concludes my presentation, and now I'm just going to pause and, and uh, wait for your questions, I guess.